So today we're finishing up the third and final um, lecture for the heart lecture. Um, we're starting today by talking about the cardiac cycle. So one cardiac cycle is going to consist of a contraction, a, rela a relaxation, uh, and, excuse me, a contraction and a relaxation of both the atria, um, and then is going to be rapidly followed by systole and diastole of both ventricles. Um, so contraction and relaxa relaxation of atria, and then contraction and relaxation of both ventricles. So there are going to be several steps that are associated with our cardiac cycle. We've got several different electrical events, as well as some pressure changes. Um, we're going to talk about the heart sounds, as well as volume changes and the mechanical events that are all associated with the cardiac cycle. So. Looking first at the electrical events um, that are associated with the cardiac cycle, and again, we measure these using the ECG that we mentioned um, previously. So, so in each cardiac cycle, both the atria and the ventricles are alternately going to contract and relax, relax or undergo systole and diastole, and this is going to in turn force blood um, from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. Um, we've seen this again, this is kind of a, um, a recurring theme throughout anatomy and physiology of things want to go from high pressure to low pressure, or high concentration to low concentration, whatever the case may be. Um, things want to go from high to low because it's just easier, it requires a lot less energy. So as a chamber of the heart contracts, the blood pressure within it is going to increase, and the pressures are going to be um, that are given in the figure that we see over here um, are going to be used in uh, millimeters of mercury, used to measure that. Um, and these are going to be just looking at the measurements of the pressure that's on the, the left side of the heart. The pressures of the right side of the heart are going to be much lower. So each ventricle, however, is going to expel about the same volume of blood per beat. Um, and the same pattern is going to exist uh, for both pumping chambers. So when um, the heart rate is about 75 beats per minute, one cardiac cycle is going to last for about 0.8 seconds. So taking a look at atrial systole, uh, that beginning of that contraction of the, of the atrial. During atrial systole, this is going to last about 0.1 seconds, and the atria are going to contract. So at the same time, the ventricles are also then going to be relaxed because it's kind of a trade-off situation here. The depolarization of the sinoatrial node is going to cause this atrial depolarization, which again is going to be marked by the P wave that we see in our EKG. The atrial depolarization is going to cause this atrial systole, and as the atria contract, they're going to exert pressure um, on the blood within. And this is going to force blood through the open AV valves into the ventricles of the heart. Atrial systole is going to contribute a final about 25 milliliters of blood to the volume that's already in each of the ventricles. And um, this is going to be a total of about 105 mils. Um, the end of the atrial systole is also going to end, is going to also be the end of ventric ventricular diastole, so it's the end of the relaxation for the ventricles. So therefore, each ventricle is going to contain a total of about 130 mils at the end of its relaxation period, or at the end of the distally. This blood volume is called the end diastolic volume. Um, and the QRS complex that's found in the ECG is also going to then mark the onset of our ventricular uh, depolarization. During ventricular systole, um, this is going to last about 0.3 seconds, and the ventric ventricles are going to be contracting, hence the name. Um, so at the same time, those atria are going to be in the process of relaxing, and so they're going to be entering into atrial distally. Ventricular depolarization is going to cause ventricular systole, and as this ventricular systole begins, the pressure is going to rise inside the ventricles, and this is going to push blood up against the atrioventricular valves, and this is going to force them to shut. So for about 0.05 seconds, both the semilunar valves and the atrioventricular valves are both going to be closed. So this period is called the isovolumetric contraction. 
and during this interval um, the cardiac muscle fibers are going to be contracting and this is going to exert force on the area but is going to um, but the, the heart is not yet starting to shorten or contract so thus the muscle contraction is going to be isometric it's going to be of the same having the same length Moreover, um, because all four valves in the heart are closed, our ventricular volume is going to remain the same. So it's also going to be considered isovolumetric. Um, so continued, this continued contraction of the ventricles is essentially what's going to cause the pressure inside those chambers to rise significantly. All right. So here we've got our very significant um, increase as we've got our very significant increase uh, during this ventricular systole period. It's a huge increase in pressure. Um, when the left ventricle pressure is going to surpass that of the aortic pressure at about 80 millimeters of mercury, and the right ventricular pressure is going to rise above its pressure in the pulmonary trunk. Um, this is going to cause both of the semilunar valves to come open. Um, so at this point, the ejection of blood from the heart is going to begin, and the period when the semilunar valves are open is going to be called ventricular ejection. Ejection, excuse me, and it's going to last for about a quarter of a second. The pressure in the left ventricle is going to continue to rise. Um, to about 120 millimeters of mercury and the pressure in the right ventricle is going to climb to about 25 to 30 or so millimeters of mercury. Um, our next steps in ventricular systole is going to be when the left ventricle is going to eject about 70 mils of blood into the aorta and the right ventricle is going to eject about the same amount of blood into the pulmonary trunk. So the volume is going that's remaining in each of these ventricles is going that's going to be remaining at the end of systole is going to be that other 60 mils or so um, of blood and this is called the end systolic volume or the ESV. Stroke volume is going to be the volume that's of blood that's ejected uh, per beat from each ventricle. And this is going to enter or equal the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume. All right, so you can see that laid out in a sort of equation form for you um, there. So at rest, the stroke volume is about um, um, 130 mils minus 60, uh, which is going to equal 70 mils. So this is going to be a little bit more than two, two ounces of blood that are, uh, that are in each stroke volume. The T wave is going to um, this that we see in our EKG there is going to mark the onset of our ventricular repolarization. Next step is our relaxation period. So during this period, um, this is going to last about 0.4 seconds, and the atria and the ventricles are both going to be relaxed. So as the heart beats faster and faster, the relaxation period is going to become shorter um, because it has to contract more rapidly. So the ventricular repolarization is going to cause the ventricular diastole. Um, and then as those ventric ventricles relax, the pressure within those chambers is going to fall. All right, so we get this huge drop here. Um, that we can see. So this is also going to correspond with the blood in the atria and the pulmonary trunk beginning to flow backwards towards the region of that lower pressure in the ventricles. The backflowing blood is going to catch in the valve cusps, and this is going to result in the closing of the semilunar valves. The aortic valves are going to be closed um, at a pressure of about 100 millimeters of mercury. And the rebound of this blood off of that closed cusp of the aorta of the aortic valve is what's going to produce the dichrotic uh, uh, oh excuse me the dichrotic wave um, on the, our, our aortic pressure chart um, so we can see that we can see that wave there 
So as the semilunar valves close, there's going to be a brief interval when the ventricular blood volume does not change um, because all four of those valves are closed. And this is called a period of isovolumetric relaxation. Again, isovolumetric because, again, the volume of blood is not changing. Next in the relaxation period, um, this is going to occur when the um, this bicuspid valve opens. Um, so as those ventricle, ventricles continue to relax, the pressure is going to fall very quickly. Uh, when the ventricle, ventricular pressure drops below the atrial pressure, the atrioventricular valve is going to open and the ventricular filling is going to begin. So the ventricles are going to start to fill up with blood again. The major part of the ventricular filling is going to occur just before uh, the AV valve opens. Um, and blood that has been flowing into and building up in the aortic in the aorta during that ventricular systole is then going to rush out rapidly. It's going to rush into the ventricles. So at the end of this relaxation period, those ventricles are going to be about three, about 75% of the way full. And then we can see our P wave is going to start to appear on our EKG. And this is going to signal a start of another cardiac cycle. So moving on now to talk about heart sounds. Auscultation is basically the act of listening to the sounds within the body. And this is typically done with a, steth with a stethoscope. And we've all seen these, um, whether either in the actual doctor's office or on TV. So the sound of the heartbeat is going to come primarily from blood turbulence. And this is caused by the closing of the heart valves. So during each cardiac cycle, there are going to be four sounds. Um, but in a normal heart, only the first and second sounds, S1 and S2, are actually going to be loud enough to be heard um, through that stethoscope. So, looking at our different heart sounds then, our first sound, our S1, is going to be described as the lub. And all you've probably heard the heartbeat described as a lub-dub sound. So S1 is the lub sound. Um, this is going to be louder and a bit longer than what we would see for our second sound. So S1 is going to be caused by blood turbulence that's associated with the closure of the atrioventricular valve soon after that ventricular systole begins. The second sound, S2, is going to be the dub sound. Right? And this is going to be a shorter sound and is not going to be as loud as the S1. S2 is caused by blood turbulence that's associated with the closure of the semilunar valve. And this is going to be, uh, begin as, um, this is going to occur at the beginning of ventricular diastole. So although S1 and S2 are in fact due to the blood turbulence that's associated with the closure of the valves, they are best heard um, at the surface of the chest in the location that's slightly different um, from the location of the actual valves themselves. And this is because the sound is going to be carried uh, by the blood flow away from those valves. Um, normally, uh, the other two sounds, S3 and S4, are not loud enough to be heard. Um, S, the S3 sound is due to blood turbulence during rapid ventricular filling, and S4 is going to be due to blood turbulence during atrial, uh, atrial systole. Now moving on to look at the cardiac output. Uh, this is the volume of blood that gets ejected from the right or the left ventricle into the aorta or into the pulmonary trunk each minute. So the stroke volume is the amount of blood that's pumped out of the ventricles um, in one beat. Right? So the cardiac output is going to be measured in mils per minute and this is going to equal the stroke volume times the heart rate. Um, so if we look at the typical resting adult male, um, to use these measurements here, we look at a stroke volume with an average of 70 mils per beat and a heart rate of about 75 beats per mil. We can calculate our cardiac output. All right? So we basically just calculate the stroke volume at 70 mils per beat um, times the beats per minute, and that leads us to once reduced and everything and converted, um, results in a 5.25 mil per minute, or liter per minute, excuse me, 
um, cardiac output for this typical resting male. Sorry, the neighbors are getting home from work. So the cardiac reserve is the difference between a person's max cardiac output and the cardiac output at rest. So the average person is going to have a cardiac reserve of about four or five times uh, the resting value of, of, of versus the uh, um, versus the max cardio output, sorry. So let's look at what regulates that stroke volume. So a healthy heart is going to pump out the blood that enters its chambers during the previous diastole. So in other words, if more blood returns to the heart during diastole, then more blood is going to be ejected during systole. So at rest, the stroke volume is going to be about 50 to 60 times or percent of the end diastolic volume, which is, and this is because 40 to 50 percent of the blood is going to remain in the ventricles after each contracted, contraction at end systolic volume. So there are going to be three main factors that are going to regulate stroke volume. All right, we've got our preload, which is the degree of stretch on the heart before contractions. We've got contractibility. This is the forcefulness of contractions of individual ventricular muscle fibers. And then the afterload, and this is the pressure that must be exceeded before ejection of blood from the ventricula ventricles can occur. So looking at preload um, and the effects of stretching on preload. So according to the Frank Starling Law of the Heart, what a great name, um, that th this states that a greater preload or stretch on cardiac muscle fibers just before they con contract is going to increase their force um, of contraction during systole. So the Frank Starling Law of the Heart equalizes the output of the right and left ventricles and it keeps the same amount of blood flowing uh, to both the systemic and pulmonary circulations. Our next um, thing that we have, our next feature that it can, um, that impacts, um, our next factor that regulates um, the stroke volume is contractibility. So myocardial contractibility is the strength of the contraction at any given preload and is going to be affected by positive and negative ionotropic agents. So a positive ion, excuse me, a positive ionotropic um, agent is going to increase contractibility and negative enotropic uh, agents are going to decrease uh, contractibility. Uh, positive enotropic uh, agents, things like epinephrine and norepinephrine, are often going to promote calcium influx um, during the cardiac action potentials, and this is going to strengthen the force of that contraction that's able to occur. So calcium channel blockers um, are found in drugs that can be used um, at, to have a negative enotropic effect, and this works by reducing uh, calcium inflow and thereby decreasing the strength of the heartbeat. So therefore, for a constant preload, the stroke volume is going to increase when the positive enotropic agents are present, and it's going to decrease when negative enotropic agents are present. And then last but not least, we have the afterload. This is the last factor that's going to impact um, the stroke volume. So um, the ejection of blood from the heart is going to begin when pressure in the right ventricle exceeds the pressure in the pulmonary trunk. This is going to be about 20 millimeters of mercury. And then when the pressure that's in the left ventricle exceeds the pressure that's in the aorta, about 80 millimeters of mercury. So at that point, the higher pressure that's in the ventricles is going to cause the blood to push those semilunar valves open. The pressure, that, um, the pressure that has to be overcome before those semilunar valves can open um, is called the afterload. And so an increase in afterload is going to cause the stroke volume to decrease. So that more blood, and this is because more blood is going to remain in the ventricles at the end of systole. So in congestive heart failure, blood is going to begin to remain in the ventricles, and this is going to increase the preload and ultimately cause um, an overstretching of the heart as well as a less forceful contraction. 
So that is all that we have for um, today's lecture. So as always, please feel free to contact me if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Um, and have a great day.